the St. Francis Yacht Club in San Francisco. This is the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, hosted by Ron Young. Welcome to our Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Have your ears, have your ears recovered from our intro music? So how fun it is for us to be back in live meetings after the pandemic. Good grief. Human beings are, uh, you know, enlivened by each other's company and all of that Zoom meeting stuff, I had it up to here. Everybody else had it up to here? Who's had it up to here with Zoom meetings? Exactly. We want live meetings again. It even turns out that this getting together with other people is good for our health. Turns out that endorphins, you know, uh, extend your longevity, make you live longer. So today is a very fun uh, talk for us because uh, as a young kid, I started sailing on little small boats. I sailed first on an eight foot, four inch sloop rigged scow. And this is before a cam action cleat. So literally to tack the boat, you would put the jib sheet in your mouth, push down the, the tiller and let go of the jib sheet as you tack the boat and pull in the new jib sheet. And when I, as I grew up, I sailed on uh, thistles and moths and other kinds of high ride, high cool rides. And then along came five O's and into my consciousness. And the first time I saw them, it was kind of like the first time I saw, you know, a 57 Chevy or that girl in the eighth grade. It was, both of them gave me the same kind of thrill at that age. And I never really got over the thrill of seeing the five O's. <laughs> <laughs> it is a kind of a fun thing. So it's great that we have um, fun sitters. Now you ask yourself, how does a person get to be a world champion in the five O's? Well, one path could be the one that one of our speakers took today. And that is to say he started sailing at age six and saw his first five O at age 18 and thought the first thing about it was, this is what the fast kids ride. This is the fastest kids in the block ride. And so he began to get addicted. And then at age 31, he won his first world championship as crew for Howie Hamlin, who's with us here today. And then uh, he realized, well, I need, to, I need to keep racing these things. And he ended up uh, winning the worlds once as a crew and four times as a skipper. And when I say crew and skipper, uh, we get to our other speaker, Adam Lowry, who's won the worlds twice with Mike and also started as a skipper and has raced all kinds of fast rides, but the five O's are the, the hottest ones. And those of you who are gonna come to the Stag Cruise know that one of our guest speakers in the Lighthouse Talks will be Cam Lewis. And he said to me today, a couple hours ago, Ron, no, I'm coming Wednesday afternoon because I want to see Mike and Adam and the guys sit on the five O's, my old, my old turf out in front of your club. Cam, as you may remember, won the five O, won the Finn World 79 and 80. And in those days, we thought the Finn world champion was the greatest sailor on earth. Uh, and then he won the five O's in uh, 81 and 82. And so he especially wanted to come and hang out with his five O buddies when he comes to be a speaker. He went on to win the round the world race, breaking the mythical 80 day record. And oh yeah, the America's Cup with Dennis Conner. But he still says the five O was the best, best thrill of all these racing events. So uh, with that, I'd like to bring up to our stage between them, eight-time world champions, Mike Martin and Adam Lowry. Come on up, boys. Tell us about the five of How's it going? We'll get the uh, presentation up here in a second. All right, so what we're going to talk about today is teamwork for success. And this is really how not just us, but the whole West Coast teams have, have excelled in the 505 class and had really great results over the past you know, 15 years. Um, it all actually started in something we call Team Tuesday. And uh, I was sailing with Howie. And uh, you know, we didn't have a tuning partner. And we needed somebody to train against. And so there was a, another young team uh, ben Benjamin and Andy Beckman, who uh, who were good sailors, and we got them into the boat, and our goal was to get them up to speed so they could push us, and they did. And it worked great, and we went to the Worlds that year in Kiberon, and, and we won the Worlds, and Andy and Benny were second. So it uh, it was, yeah, just proof in the pudding right away. Mike, can you introduce the uh, other five of us here in the room? 
Yeah. Okay. Well, the most important one is Adam Lowry. Oh. Okay. <laughs> because anyone that sails five O's knows that the crew is the most important part of the whole boat. Uh, the other key people in our training group. So I introduced Howard Hamlin, who kind of, kind of he and I sort of discovered this concept. Also is Eric Anderson. He's our main training partner uh, for the past couple of years up here in San Francisco, and he's really been pushing us. And yeah, we really appreciate all the effort he's put into it. And uh, look out for them next week because they're blazing fast. Um, yeah, uh, Jeff Nelson is here, Razor and Jeff. Jeff and I sailed together for years and years, and we won the worlds together here in San Francisco in '09. Um, and yeah, there's a bunch of other 505 sailors in the, the fleet here. Um, you know, other world champions? Yeah, Ian's a world champion. Sail twice? Twice, yeah. It's from the UK. Um, but yeah, so we're, we're lucky to have a, a super strong fleet here, and we have our visitors from the UK and the rest of the world here for the Worlds next week. All right, so quick agenda of what we're going to cover. There's three main aspects that we really want to go over. One, the sharing of information. It's super critical you share all information. Two, you've got to keep innovating. And three, you have to be efficient with your training. So those are the big points that we're going to key on. All right. Um, you know, there's a lot of big organized programs, you know, like in the UK, the whole Pinnell and Bax, you know, superpower program. You got to, it's tough, tough to keep up with those guys. And so um, often in every boat you sail, there's bigger budgets and, and more developed programs that you have to compete against. Uh, and yeah, you have to compete against. So, you know, what can we do? To, to compete against programs like that. And really, we have to maximize our most valuable asset, and that's each other, um, our own tuning partners. And so how we you know, utilize each other and how we organize our training has really been the key to our success. Um, and it's also a shift, a shift in the way we think. Um, often everyone just wants to, you know, you know beat beat just the person next to him. And maybe, you know, you often see this in Olympic sailing. It's like you you don't share information and you're just trying to beat the, the other team. Um, but we have the opposite, is we're trying to bring up the whole our whole fleet because the faster they are, the more they push us, the more it forces us to, to innovate and get better and, and figure it out. Yeah, so a couple, couple of principles just for how we sort of do this, this, this first part. So the, the sharing of information is all about, first of all, trying to train with the best people you can. Um, and ideally training with somebody that's better than you are because you're going to rise to their level of performance over time, especially if you're learning what they're doing. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, the, the second is, is to figure out what's working and what the, the quickest boats are doing and do those things. So obviously, you can't do that if you're not sharing the, uh, the information, but it starts with setup, it starts with boat preparation, and it goes all the way through tactics, um, through what's going on in the race course and how you address uh, a race. Um, and then we try to exp expand that even more broadly. We, we do a lot of training sort of one-on-one -on -one boat or two or three boats. Uh, here in the Bay Area, and then when we get the opportunity to go to an event where we've got more of us, um, we'll try to expand that circle uh, to increase the learning as well. Yeah, so innovation. It doesn't matter how good you are, we've all got a long way to go, right? We've no, everyone's far from perfect. Um, and the 5.0 is a relatively open class, and there's a lot happening in sailing. And so it's important to, to look at the different classes and see what's working and, and to sail other classes. I was lucky, lucky enough to sail 14s with Zach Berkowitz, who's a world champion in that class. And yeah, just that experience, you learn what works in those boats, and all that can be applied. Um, also, 
like it's very important to actually read the class rules of your boat and understand what you can do and what you can't do. And I remember when I started sailing with, with Howie, you know, he was taking pin whiffs of luff curve out of the main and I was like, well, you know, look at the rest of the boat. Why is why does the centerboard have, you know, eight inches of gap behind it in the centerboard case? Like and and I said, well, you know, what are the rules there? And we look at the rules and it's like it just has to fit in the case. And then there was a program that we set up to start developing faster, faster center boards. And, and uh, again, we developed these high aspect boards and uh, that was in 20, uh, 1999 and one, two, three in the world's our boards were that year. So um, yeah, always be testing, always try new things. Uh, don't be afraid to try new techniques and practice you never know what might work and what might not work. Yeah, we've got a couple of tricks up our sleeve for this regatta. We've done some sail development that a few people have been in on. Uh, maybe we haven't shared all of that information, have we yet? Uh, <laughs> no, our, well, sail, our sailmaker retired, so um, <laughs> there's only a few of those sails around, but most of the people in the room have one, so uh, hopefully those are going to go well in the event. All right, so yeah, we can talk about like on the water testing and when you are testing equipment and trying something new. So it's very important to, you know, it's the scientific method, you limit the variables. So one team, once you get two, two boats that are relatively close in speed, one boat locks in and they're the benchmark. And then the other boat makes the change. And you only change one thing at a time. You don't go out and put up a new mast and a new main and a new centerboard all at once because you're not going to know which of those uh, made the difference. It's very important to switch boats, and nobody likes doing it. <laughs> and uh, especially out here because you got to go, uh, go swimming with all the great whites to do it. But, uh, <clears throat> yeah, what we found is if you leave the, bo the dock switched, it's better because that's one less switch you have to do on the water and everyone has the desire to get back in their own boat. Um, so yeah, leave the dock switched. Uh, yeah, only switch one person at a time. If, you know, like when you are switching at the water, only s switch the skipper or the crew because then the new person comes in and the other person can explain what the settings were and what you were doing and, and what the setup was. And then, you know, when you switch in, you can look at it and experience and feel it. So. It's also helpful from a technique standpoint because you've got one person who's been sailing with the other person that just switched or didn't switch and can comment on, oh, I, the boat feels you're driving it differently because of this or, you know, what, what have you. So you can kind of compare the technique between different, uh, different crews and skippers in addition to just the setup. And, yeah, and, you know, we're talking about just switching with two boats, but – it's great if you can get a third boat out in this scenario, it's really good when you start testing gear because sometimes, yeah, you swap stuff and you don't know is, well, is that boat going slow or are we going fast? But if you have that sort of third boat there as a standard, that really helps a lot. So getting that third boat out is good. Yeah, I think another thing that we do here is it, it, also, it also extends to tactical decisions. So, you know, tactics are... You know, you're responding to what's happening out there on the race course. You're also trying to anticipate what's happening next. And you often have a point of view about what is going to happen next, what side's going to be favored. And Mike and I very often while we're training uh, with our training partners will consciously make the decision to do the thing that we think is wrong. Um, and uh, that ends up being really good learning because sometimes we were wrong about being wrong or we were right about being wrong and actually – you learn a ton from that um, and even more than you do by just always going where you think is right. And sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Sometimes you go what you think is the wrong way and it works out. And that helps you figure out, like, what is this picture on the race course that's happening? Um, and you learn at a greater level of depth so that when you actually get out there and race, you know, you've got it more figured out. And the next point, I think, is the most important of, of all of this stuff, you know, in testing and everything, you got to communicate with your teammates and you have to do it often and you have to be th thorough and complete in it. And uh, so you share all information, how the boat feels, you know, what your settings are, you know, what you thought the wind was doing, 
you know, a lot of times like, oh, yeah, we'll do a split and, uh, you know, and come back together. And we're trying to determine if, if it was current or not. But, you know, you got to tell them it's like, yeah, we came out ahead, but we got a 15 degree shift. So, you know, let's discount that. But communicating everything all the time and in between lineups. So you do a lineup, chat after the lineup. You do a split, chat after the split. You come in, you have a debrief at, uh, at the end of your training session. So I think it's really important, that communication. Um, and then the other thing to remember is that when you are testing new equipment, you know, we have this tendency to just try to, to win every drill, right? And, like, you know, you often see somebody will line up above you and then they'll just try to, like, foot over you just to squash you. But, like, remember the point of the drill is to test the equipment, right? So it's not to win the drill. It's to determine what works and what doesn't. Um, so, yeah. Very important there. Uh, time is very valuable. Like most of us have regular jobs, and our time in the water is actually extremely small. Like we only spend, you know, on days that we train, which is only, you know, one or two days a week or a month or whatever, and you only spend a couple or a few hours a day on the water. So it's actually very limited time you spend on the water super important to make sure that that you use that time efficiently and and don't waste it and and eric's chuckling because <laughs> because whenever uh, because the, mike gets grumpy when yeah, time is wasted let's just be clear yeah yeah, yeah that's a good way to yeah, put it yeah. um, um but yeah so then the the question is is you know how can we be efficient with the training and uh and yeah, we'll kind of go into that in the next couple of slides, but, you know, the, the big view is have a plan, stick to the plan, and, uh, and, and be on time. And, yeah, you know, also we don't, you know, most of us fiber sailors don't have coaches and coach boats out there. So it's important to know that we have to depend on ourselves to do this. So it's self-discipline. Yeah. All right. So a couple of sort of base conditions. I mean, first of all, you got to make sure your boat works. Um, and we put a lot of time, Mike puts a lot of time into preparing our boat. Uh, let's be honest about that. Um, uh, but that's really important. Like, you know, nothing's worse than you get this precious time, you go out there, something breaks and you got to go in. Um, uh, we do a lot of work to make sure that the boats are set up similarly so we, we can compare notes. Like when something's working and you're screaming at each other on the water because it's loud and trying to compare that you have very, and we even have hand signals about different settings that we're able to very quickly relay. Here's how the mast is set up. Here's how the jib's set up and, and, and so forth. That's all just meant to be more efficient and, and accelerate the learning that happens um, on the water. Um, Obviously, having consistent time, having consistent communication, radios on the water, all that's important. Um, but probably one of the biggest Im important things is our pre-briefs and our debriefs, uh, making sure that we know what we're trying to accomplish that day. Um, and then after we come in, uh, what happened in that review process, you often learn that what you thought was going on or what you thought the reason was that something was working maybe was a little bit different when you're able to discuss it in more depth with your training partners. Um, yeah, so again, on the training, set a time and leave the dock on time. Uh, follow the plan for the day. The next one, stay together so many times. The more boats you get, you know, everyone just scatters all over the bay. So um, make sure that you're always together. And if, there's, if you're going upwind and you're in, you know, you're the most leeward boat, get up and with the other boats. If you're the most leeward boat, chances are the other two boats are waiting for you. And same thing, if you're, you know, if you're going downwind and you're behind, the other boats are waiting for you. So just stick together. That way you can communicate, you can get the next drill started and, and get going. Um, and that kind of leads to the next point, always be ready for the next drill. Know what the plan is, be ready to go. Uh, don't sail off into a corner. Uh, Sort of the format, the ideal format is to practice racing. And it's great. Having marks is super important because it forces you to race and to think and not just sail in a fast and a straight line. 
And actually, Howie and I figured this out in Long Beach. We were just doing drag racing, drag racing, drag racing, and we were we got to be very quick. And then we went to a championship, and we'd get off the line, and we'd win our side. And and lo and behold, that was the wrong side. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, and then we shifted the way we practiced to to practice racing. Practice. You have to practice thinking tactical while you're trying to go fast. Uh, so and also, if one boat gets too far ahead. Either reset, and a great way to reset is to do a circle, like just do a 360 or a 270 if you don't have time, or if you're way ahead, you can do a 720. I think we're going to maybe talk about coaches yet. No? No. All right, the debrief. Yeah, you want to just talk about some of the, the questions here, go into a little bit of detail on how we do that? Yeah. So the, the debrief is, you know, we do that after – training and we also do it after regattas and it's actually one of the parts of the US 505 class that I think helps helps the whole class get better and helps retain a lot of the people and it helps everyone learn um, so often at regattas we'll have a group debrief afterwards and and I think here's a picture I think at the NAs in Cork and they have the top three teams of the day up there talking about what they did and what worked and what didn't work and how their boat was set up and what they were looking for and what was important and what they were focusing on and uh, and what was good and why they thought that was good and and we include everyone in the audience to to speak up and you know see what they thought worked and didn't work and it's uh, you never know where the good ideas are going to be coming from and so, yeah, it's important to keep a super open attitude. And generally what we found is the teams that gain the most are the ones that have the most open mind. Yeah, and it makes it – it keeps it more fun for everybody as well. You know, I mean, we've all probably raced in boats where, you know, you race and then everybody scatters at the end of the day and, you know, you kind of maybe didn't do so well and you don't really know why you didn't do so well. Um, here you get an opportunity to understand what the people at the top of the fleet were doing. Uh, and why they were doing those things. And, you know, that gets you better. You feel better about that time you just spent on the water and your chances the next time. Yeah, and so, yeah, we talked about training a bunch and race days. So race days, until you're at a championship, are actually just another practice day. So, our, you know, we have a goal for the year. And, uh, and this year it's the upcoming World Championship Regatta. And I think every regatta leading up to that, we see as just an opportunity to train and to, and to get better. So, um, we, yeah, we go through the same things. We talk about, before we go out, we all talk about the conditions and what we think is going to be important and what isn't. Um, yeah, obviously you got to show up on time. Um, yeah share the conclusions from the previous race day from the previous races especially race days on the race course and then like in between races we'll talk about what worked and what didn't and why um gets sailing out together is is really valuable like before the first race you know you can line up you got to sail out to the race course anyway so you line up with your tuning partner and you get up to speed and then by the time ra the race starts you're all dialed in and ready to go and then all the normal things that you can do with your, your tuning partner. You can do splits. You can check wind and current and, and then chit-chat and, and share all that information, you know, before the race starts. All right. So, you know, we, we, we kind of hit on each of the three of these, sharing the information, innovating, and being efficient. Um, you know, for us, I think – probably the, the most important thing to take away from it is it's a, it's a recipe to help us to really focus on just getting a little bit better every time we go out um, because we feel like if we're doing that, then uh, we're going to have a good chance in the next championship. Um, and probably most importantly, you know, it, it keeps it really interesting. Uh, it keeps us learning, and that learning is, uh, is the fun part um, for, for, for I think all of us. And then, yeah. That's the end of our presentation, and I think this picture kind of says it all. The goal is to have you and your tuning partners fill the podium at the uh, at the event, and and there, I, I tell you, there's no better feeling than have you and your tuning partners all up there at the same time. 
So. Okay, so um, when we were mentioning people who are sailing the room, we also do want to acknowledge Zach Berkowitz, good skip sailor, knows a little bit about this game, Zacho. Um, let's see, give everybody the specs in a 5 0. Push the button here, you're going on. Push it up. <laughs> it's 5.05 meters long, which is about 17 feet. Um, yeah, I don't, boy, I don't know the specs. I don't know the sail well, area. Well, it weighs 280 pounds, fully rigged. Yeah. Right. I don't know how much sail area there is, but, but yeah. a good amount. How yeah. wide are the, the dra beam of the boat? It's about six feet. And, uh, yeah, the mass is about 25 feet tall. Uh, it'll, you know, planes upwind and probably 14 knots of wind. Planes downwind and much less than that. Uh, top speed. I think our top speed this year on our little Garmin watch was 24.2 knots or something downwind this spring. There were some big days this spring. <laughs> um, yeah, and yeah, main jib, spinnaker, trapeze, uh, cruise on a trapeze, and the skipper's hiking. How many races and how many practice, how many days on the water will you guys spend a year in a, in a uh, world's year? Days on the water. Uh, I mean, it does vary quite a bit for Mike and I based on. Uh, well, it's my mic not working. Um, it varies quite a bit for for Mike and I just based on life. Give <laughs> uh, that mic, give that mic. But uh, you know, if you want to work on that, um, teamwork here. Um, but you know, this this year we've been uh, we've been training a lot. I mean, uh, what has it been 60, 70 days, maybe eighty. Mm -hmm. Um, that we've been on the water this this year, so quite a bit. Sixty or seventy days in the water, I think so. How many how right? many races? Well, we do we do one basically we average one event like one racing like one regatta a month um, on the schedule more or less um, for probably nine or ten months the warm, you know the warm windy months here, um, and so generally we got one two three four day event uh, a month. And then a bunch of practice in between. And then, you know, one world's a year. Number of competitors in a typical race? Yeah, I think, you know, on the West Coast, you know, it's, we'll get a small regatta, it'll be 10 boats, and a big regatta, it'll be 20. And then, yeah, PCCs was probably 25. And the and NAs will be anywhere from, you know, 30 to 40. And then a world. This will be a, a smaller world, but, you know, a small world will be 50, and a big world will be 200. And so talk about rabbit starts. Talk about the starting uh, procedure as the fleet gets bigger. Yeah, so 505s always use gate starts at championships, which is a rabbit start. And, you know, when you first come into the class, you're kind of like, well, that's kind of weird. But it takes about one regatta to be completely convinced that it's a better way to start in big fleets. We usually have about one general recall per world. And usually that's like in light air, something happens and somebody gets in front of the rabbit and, and they have to restart the race. But yeah, if you've ever been in a big fleet where you know there's black flags and general recalls and half the boats are thrown out, we don't deal with that at all. So the, the rabbit starts on Port Tack and there's a gate boat, a power boat that follows them. And everyone ducks that gate boat on starboard tack. And after, once you duck the, the gate boat, you're, you've started and you're free to race wherever you like. And, and it's fantastic. And, you know, it's a really, actually a really good way to uh, start the race. And, and the tactics, there's definitely tactics and they're definitely very different than a line start. But, uh, but it's equally, if not more tactical than a line start. No mid-line no mid sag. Yeah, no it's a real such thing. <laughs> exactly. So boat builders, talk about boat builders. Um, yeah, right now, I think 90% of the boats are built in the UK by Ovington. Um, there might be one in Australia. My boat is a Larry Tuttle, a water rat, 
Larry Tuttle's in Santa Cruz. Uh, it's very, very difficult to get Larry to build you a boat. So if you ever get the opportunity, buy one. I think Howie has the last one ever made. Um, and it's eight years old now or something. Um, yeah, but I'd say, yeah, if you want a new boat, just call up Ovington and you can have one in, um, in pretty quickly. Man, nice pitch for Ovi there. I like that. <laughs> should get a little vague on that. Yeah. Yeah, this is a great time to buy a boat from Ovington because the pound is – is weak. We like that. Um, so I, I don't know what it costs because I last time I bought a boat was ten years ago. So I'm not sure what they cost a new Ovington ballpark. Eric, well, Holt is selling a four-year-old boat for twenty-six. No, no, twenty-four thousand. Yeah, 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 twenty-four Yeah, we'll say, I think, yeah, 40, it's got to be 40 with everything, with covers and sails and everything. And so when you want to buy a, uh, the first set of sails, what's the first set going to cost? Three sails. Yeah, I don't know. I try not to Ball remember park. those yeah. numbers. Yeah, we, Ball don't park. Look, we don't look at those invoices. Five don't grand, show you, five don't grand show. for a set of sails. Five, four, yeah. four, four grand yeah. for sales. Uh, how long is a training session to, your, when you do training sessions, yeah, two exactly. hours. Yeah. Two hours. <laughs> it's the cruise. Yeah, it's like you know, you're you try to get try to be efficient and get as much as you can out of it. Um, you know, we're no spring chickens, so you end up getting tired after a couple of hours, and you know, and you start to mentally wane, and then you usually go in. Sometimes uh, on weekends and such, we'll do a couple of sessions, so you can. You can go out for two hours and go out for another hour later or something. Form factor of the crew. Crew crew's going to always be hopefully longer. What's your, what's your goal there? What's the form factor? Adam? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Doesn't get Leverage. much better than that. Yeah. Adam, 6'6 six, six and 205. And I'm, I'm big for a driver. I'm 6'2", 175, 180. Um, so, yeah, Adam's – for the West Coast, Adam's probably on the lighter side, but – yeah, to have definitely over six feet is great. The more over six feet, the better, and anywhere from 200 to 220 probably. And overall crew weight, you know, um, 380 to 400 for San Francisco. You don't want to be over 400, I don't think. Yeah, and with a big crew, you can be quite light as a skipper. Um, we, have, we have several women in the fleet that do very well um, being, you know, 115 or something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, talk about the most breeze you uh, – talk about the, the range of most regattas, breeze range. We were windy. Who else is windy? Uh, you know, the, the cool thing about the 505 is that it sails well in a huge range of conditions. And, you know, five or six knots, yeah, you're kind of sailing it like a dinghy and it's nimble and tactical and, and you know, you can tack on shifts. You don't lose much in tacks. And then, yeah, in the moderate breeze, you know, the thing starts planing, um, you know, planes downwind pretty early and planes upwind in sort of the mid-teens. And then, yeah, when it – on the other end, you know, you can you can take it out in 30 knots and you can go out in smooth – well, you know, smooth water here in a flood or chop or in Santa Cruz, you know, you got, you know, waves the size of this room and it's great in that too. So it's an extremely versatile boat. Um Partly due the, to the hull design, but partly due to the fact that, uh, you know, the rig's very adjustable. You know, we can adjust the rake. We can adjust our spreaders. We can adjust whatever you want. So you can adjust a lot of the stuff on the fly and, uh, and make the boat set up for any condition. So years ago when I sailed skiffs, we'd have like three sets of masts, three kinds of masts. And in the, in the uh, Ultimate 30 circuit, we would have different masts for different conditions. What about the 5.0? You're basically always keeping the one design. Yeah, you know, we have we have some light air jibs and light air spinnakers and yeah, I don't think anyone has. I think at a world's you can only measure in one mast. So you're using the same mast for the whole for the whole event and uh and you can measure two mains, two jibs, two spinnakers. So you could have sails that are sort of specified to one condition or another but you know what we found is if you do that they better have a lot of overlap because it's really hard to predict 
what's going to happen on any given day. And, and also, you know, you leave it, leave the dock at 1130 and it's blowing eight and, you know, by four o'clock it's blowing 25. So it's gotta yeah, work you out. never get caught out with the big rig on. So yeah. that, that's nice. Yeah. <laughs> so how many masts do you have? Yeah, we've got two. Well, we have two here and then there's, uh, there's one sitting beside my house and then Howie just, just brought one up that I tried to dump on him and he's dumping another one back on me. So, yeah, I mean, there's only two that we use really. Talk about what's different between the two, the two masts. Not a whole lot. They're both altos. One's a backup for the other. And in case something happens to one, then we have the other one ready to go and it's tuned. It's the goal is to have it as close to the first as possible. So it's just a spare. What wind speed does it take to plane up breeze and reach down breeze? I think I think upwind you can probably start planning upwind in 14, 12? 15 knots, and then downwind, yeah, it's probably ten knots or ten or eleven or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how many times do you capsize in a typical race? Uh, zero, ideally, um, <laughs> and and you know these boats, yeah, you, you know it's, there's not a lot of capsizing that's that's happening, you know, at the the front half of the fleet. Even in the big stuff, they're much easier. I mean, Mike mentioned it, but in a big blow, one of the things that's great about the five O's, you're still racing it really hard. Um, we've uh, many of us here have sailed a lot of f boats that are faster through the water, but are scarier, and ones that you know, in a big blow, you're dialing it back just to keep the thing in one piece and keep yourself in one piece. You don't have to do that in a five O. You can send it, um, and that's that's one of the things that's fun about it. So in the ultimate thirties, we discovered since they were a new class and everybody was flipping every race at least once, we decided to have actually practices on recovering from the flip, and we actually had eight crew positions, and so uh, you know, uh, Sylvester would have one number, I have another number, Healy would have another number, and this you know Erickson would have Steve Erickson have another number, and we'd go through, we'd say four does this, two does this, one does this, whatever, and we timed our time recovery. And we actually got down so we could flip the boat um, down the breeze and get the boat back up in like, you know, a minute and a half or something, which was crazy because if you didn't practice that when it did happen, if and when it did happen during a regatta, you'd lose like three minutes or something, whatever the heck it is. That was a huge thing. Three minutes in a boat this fast is like, you know, 30 lengths or some damn thing. So let's talk about sail jail. I mean, practicing on the water. <laughs> When you when you got basically in test mode, and you're basically sailing along, and we called it that in '83 in the America's Cup, we first were doing two boat testing with Defender and Courageous, two 12 meters next to each other, and we would sail 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. How long are you on a leg? How long are your tests? Describe a test session. What's the methodology that you guys use now, 30 years later, 40 years later? Yeah, you know, if we're line, we have a couple things we do. We do, we either line up, we race, or we split. Or sort of three practice modes, and if we do a lineup, yeah, you just you line up. You know, we'll say we we'll start on starboard, and we'll kind of go until it's clear one boat's out ahead. And uh, you know, a couple things we noticed here: one, if you're you know if you're in the other boat's breeze, then you're just wasting your time at that point. Um, the other thing we noticed here in San Francisco that it's just so different. At different parts of the bay and, and even relatively close is like if the you know if the right's better and the boat to the right starts gaining then they get further to the right and this the separation just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and so i think you go until it's clear you know which boat or which setting is better and then yeah then you reset so that might be that might be you know two or three minutes it might be 30 seconds it just depends on the day and, and what you're testing and what the conditions are. Yeah, and then that's when it's important to switch often, right? So we see out here a lot of times that there's a bias of one side or the other. And so the boat that's on whatever side is winning. So then you got to switch the two boats to figure out, was it the boat that was going faster or was it the advantage? Right. So um, in a typical world's regatta, how many races? Ten. I think ten. Always ten. And um, what's your attitude about how, how do you spend tactically conservative early in the regatta? What, what's your strategy that way? What do you think about in that? Are you thinking about that these days at all? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we think about it pretty similarly to, you know, 
what what people often say, which is early in the ra- or early in the regatta, you can't win it, but you can lose it. Uh, and so you got to get out of the gates uh, pretty well, which Mike and I have a history of not doing. Um, <laughs> and we'll try to do that better in this event. Um, and then you, you know, towards the end of the event, you, you get a little bit more aggressive. Um, I think, I think that's how most people do it. Yeah. And generally we, yeah, at a world we'll sail conservative, you know, we'll, we tend to gate closer to the middle of the line, um, and just, yeah, not, not take any big chances early on. And that's, you know, sometimes that's worked and sometimes it hasn't. In, in England, the, the world's in 2016, in the first two races we were, I think in the first race we started in the middle and just got whipsawed and I think we rounded up 30th and the boats that gated early all won the race and it's like, okay, fine, we'll go start early and we gated early and a massive righty came in and we rounded the weather mark in 70th or something and got back to 40th. So we started the regatta with a 34, 44 or something. <laughs> Horrible. But, you know, I think the important thing is we kept our heads and said, okay, well, there's two drops and we just used our two drops. So uh, you got to use them at some point. And, uh, we and got it, it over with early. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and then, you know, we just sailed consistently from that point on. We didn't take any big risk. And, uh, you know, I think we had all top five finishes after that. <clears throat> Now, if we dropped a microphone on the boat when you're going upwind, give us give us role play a little bit about what's what you what you're saying to each other. Yeah, so upwind, uh, I I call the tactical decisions. Um, so you know, I'm trying to look around as much as I can, which can be a little bit challenging when you're horizontal and getting sprayed in the face. Um, <laughs> but you know, everybody deals with it. Um, so usually before the race, we've talked about what we think is going to work and we have like a general broad strategy of how we're going to address the race that we've sort of agreed upon. And then once we get into the race, I'm sort of making the tactical calls here and there. Um, but uh, but Mike is often giving me information, both tactical and on how the boat is feeling. So, um, you know, I try to feel the boat as much as I can from the crew position, um, but he'll give me input on like how the boat is feeling so that um, – we, one of the things we'll talk a lot about is modes. Um, so whether in a straight VMG mode, a foot mode, a you know a tactical high mode. So so that'll be part of the discussion. Um, and then he'll tell me what he's seeing. He's also getting sprayed in the face wor- worse than I am. But um, he'll you know if he can see pressure somewhere or something like that, he's giving me that input um, so that you know then we may make a decision to attack or whatever go wherever you know we're both on board with that. Um, and then for us, and it's different with other boats, that switch is downwind. Um, so he calls the tactics downwind, and I give him input while I focus on, you know, spinnaker trim and trying to make the boat go fast. What are you saying, Mike, when you're up going up the breeze? Usually just like, <laughs> spitting water out, getting sprayed in the face. Or what? Um, no, but yeah, what I'm looking I mean, yeah, Adam's definitely calling most of the tactics, and I have a little window that I can see. You know, I can see, you know, sort of like this 20 degree zone for the next, you know, one to, you know, 30 seconds. And so if something's happening in that zone, yeah, you know, he'll say, like, yeah, we need to go in the next 20 or something. And I'm like, yeah, okay, the, that puff in 10 seconds, let's go in that or something. So, yeah, I'm sort of like short range within the window I can see, and, and Adam's definitely sort of big big picture beat. And then, as Adam said, downwind, yeah, he's focusing more on keeping the, the boat going fast and, and trimming the kite, and it's a lot drier downwind and I can look around and uh, and then yeah I'm just you know looking for shifts and pressure and fleet management downwind yeah well one thing where we also try to do this doesn't always happen but is to tell the other guy kind of what's happening on that leg big picture so that you kind of can translate that to the next leg because we're switching right Mm -hmm. so upwind I mean uh, I've driven these boats like you, you don't see anything you get to the weather mark and you're sort of like you know you know, you, you know, you're, you're, you, you now can see. Um, so I'll try to, you know, while we're going up wind, you know, let him know this is happening or that's happening. He does the same downwind. Yeah. And so, yeah, we'll talk about like, okay, we're going to do, you know, a straight set or a jibe set or whatever. And, and you get to the leeward mark and it's like, okay, yeah, we want to, we want to make a right turn or a left turn at the bottom. And, and, uh, you know, there, because there's pressure on this side or something. And then, 
then from there, like you round and yeah, you, okay, I got the picture and then you can, can go. So we all complain when racing about the fact that we can't really do any sightseeing at all. But you do sail in places where there's lots of current. We sail in races here where there's current. The circle has less current, still current, but less current. What do you prefer, racing in the bay or racing down in places like the circle where there's less current? They're all good. It's They're all good tactical spots. Uh, racing in front of Alcatraz is great because you don't have to sail six miles back to the club when you're done. <laughs> so, so I prefer racing in front of Alcatraz. And yeah, it's got a lot more current. So. But, but, you know, that's just another aspect of the race course. Race committee, you heard that, right? <laughs> We've already had that conversation. <laughs> When you're not racing five O's or sailing five O's, what other boats are you sailing? Uh, we both race very poorly foil kite boards. Um, we race in the Thursday night series that they have here. And, you know, we do okay in that. But, the you know, the Olympic level guys are just head and shoulders faster than us. But, uh, but yeah, it's, they're super fast, super efficient, fun boats to sail. So I mentioned I sailed moths as a kid. Have you been foiling on a moth, either of you? Yeah, I sailed, I sailed moths for several years, sort of around 2010 to 2012-ish, something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. So um, that was maybe five years after they got up on foils mm -hmm. and had enough development that they weren't breaking all the time. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, really fun boats. Yeah, Adam's a moth North American champion. Good on you. Yeah, really. <clears throat> That's the game. So um, what about bigger boats? What's interesting or not interesting about bigger boats? Uh, I guess I need to speak here because I think Mike doesn't ever sail a boat with a keel on it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I actually spend my summers in northern Michigan um, with my family. Um, and there's an old, it's a little bit like the Woodies. There's an old class of boat up there called a northern Michigan. That was, they were all built in the 30s. Um, and so I race one of those. Um, it's a little bit like a Shields, um, and it is very slow. Um, and so a lot of days I will race my NM and then go foiling kiteboarding. And so I'm kind of bookending as slow and as fast as you can go in one day. Now, I've been asking questions in a mile a minute, but I want to know if there's a question in the audience. Give Jim Bradley the mic. Jim Bradley is also a great sailor and sails a Mercury, which I sailed against him 60 years ago as well. Go ahead, Jimmy. Um, my question is, how is your class doing at getting the 20 to 30-year-old people in there? I know in the Mercury class we're talking about getting the 50 to 60-year-old people <laughs> in there. But, I mean, we all have the problem that those kites and all that stuff that uh, Johnny Heineken brought around here is very attractive. And are we going to get the young people sailing 505s? And one other comment before I... It, Dennis Surtees was the 505 key guy around here for years. And I think everybody that knew him, um, he really worked at keeping that class active and alive here and kind of miss him. Cheer for I, Dennis, Dennis uh, Surtees. Here, here, Dennis. Good on you, mates. Actually, can you hand the microphone to this guy right here? This is Eric Anderson. He's our tuning partner, and he's in, you know, that's a team in their 20s and 30s. And uh, so maybe, Eric, yeah, you can talk about Standard. Why you sail five O's and and yeah, what what people of your age group see in it? Hey everyone, um, yeah, I think you know it's definitely a challenge, and you know there's a lot to be said. You know, the, you can get into a wing for cheaper than a five O and go sailing by yourself and not have to find a partner. Um, but I think there's a lot of great stuff about the five O too that at least is you know there are several young people in the audience here and in the fleet that that it appeals to them. So I, you know it's it's a boat that is high performance, but not so high performance that you have to be a professional to sail it. Um, it's, you know, it definitely an, um, appeals to a lot of engineering-minded people. Um, and, it, you know, it's faster than anything you sail in college and, and all of that. And I think that's, that's appealing. Um, in terms of, like, actually getting people into it, I think that the easiest way is, try, like, I bring out a lot of new drivers because um, I have a boat and know how to crew, and that's pretty easy to put skippers slot in a lot easier than crews, I think. Um, and I, my attitude is always, like, just just expose people to it, but don't expect them to get into the class right now. And the number, we've had maybe four 
or so skippers who I took out and two years ago and then they show up after college, you know, because they were in college then and now they're out of college, but they living, they're living in SF and are like, oh, I remember I went sailing and would be interested in coming back. Um, or uh, I sailed Finns for a while in, in the past couple years and told every Finn sailor there ever and now the Finns out of the Olympics and I've had a couple say, hey, how do I do more sailing in the 5 because I'm the right size to crew. Um, so I think it's sort of just uh, building the numbers, like exposing people to it, and, and it's very hard to say, I want to get this one person to commit to coming into the class, because you just don't know, and you don't know if it's right in their life at that time, or if it will be in four years, or something like that. So that's what I have to say. Great. So uh, you mentioned uh, technical orientation of sailors in the 5 uh, What are you? What are your day jobs? Mike, what do you do when you're not racing a 5 for work? I'm a mechanical engineer, and actually, I'm now I'm a mechanical engineer manager, so I don't do as much engineering as I used to. But uh, um, yeah, I work for a company called Synapse Product Development in the city, and it's a contract design firm. So we'll, you know, design or develop whatever product you want. Um, and then, yeah, it's great to have that engineering mindset for all the systems on the 505 because it's yeah, there's there's a lot going on in there. Uh, yeah, I've got a chemical engineering degree, so Mike asked me all the chemistry questions. <laughs> There's not a lot of those on a 5 fortunately. Um, and yeah, professionally these days, I'm a consultant in the climate technology space. I, I do finance for large green energy projects. Mm -hmm. so those are big projects, and there's a growing number of those like crazy. Unbelievable. So um, the average age of a 5 sailor these days, that question came up. Average age. Yeah, it's it's higher than we'd like. Um, I don't know. The average driver is probably in the 40s or something, and the average crew is probably just younger than that would be my guess. When you're on the water in testing environment, how do you share information back and forth with each other? Are you using radios, phones? What are you using? Yeah, we have uh, VHF, handheld VHFs which sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. You know, when it's super windy and super wavy, the, the mics get, once they're soaked in water, it, they don't work very well. Um, so yeah, in moderate breeze, we use VHF a little bit. And in, when it's really windy, you just do your drill and then you laugh up next to each other and then you yell back and forth and, you know, and but that's part of the planning. If you know what the plan is beforehand, um, you know, you know what you're going to do next, and you know what you're testing, and you can usually communicate what, what you want pretty quickly. Some hand-waving involved. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we also do have hand symbol, symbols for a lot of our settings, so that, uh, that, that makes, it, uh, you know, makes it easier to communicate how we're set up. Question over here. Adam. No, oh, this is Mark. Mark yeah. is back from the Fastnet. Good on you, Mark. Just Mark a quick Kersey. question with regards to um, different venues and getting familiar with a new venue for a competition. Maybe share a little bit of notes in terms of a new venue. You've never sailed there before. What steps do you do to familiarize yourself and the local conditions to, to kind of get in the game? Yeah, it's, it's tough because, you know, usually we have regular jobs and you can only get to the event maybe a week before the world and you can go out and see what the conditions are like. The other problem is because there's a 5 Worlds there, it's never like that here. <laughs> so we went to Cork, Ireland last year, and everyone said, dress warm, it's freezing cold, it rains all the time, and it blows the dog off the chain. And we got there, and it was sunny, warm, and blowing 10 knots at the most. Yeah, and they canceled four days of racing yeah. for no end. Yeah, I mean, I think what's important... I mean, what we try to do is with whatever limited time we have is it's it's one of the things that's great about sailboat racing is that there's so many different things going on. Um, and that's its challenge. It's to try to figure out what's going to be important on any one given day, race or leg. Um, and, you know, here we got a lot of current. I'm sure that's going to be a factor. Some places have none. Um, what's going on with the breeze, wave state, all of that. It's just trying to take in all of that information and then sort it and figure out, okay, these are the three things that we need to concentrate on that are most important for performing in this race. Um, Cause you know, it's pretty easy to screw yourself into a knot or tie yourself into a knot. If you're thinking about 55 different things, at least it is for me. 
So talk about jibing, five O's. Just jibing first, and then later we're talking about jibing in real breeze. Don't get hit in the head with the spinnaker pole. <laughs> um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have Mike describe this to you. The only thing I'll say is that when I was a skipper, um, I ended up almost getting my ear taken off. I had 37 stitches to sew this ear back on uh, because I did this wrong. So, Mike, how do we jibe? Yeah, there's a couple of different techniques. I mean, we have a different... You know, different heavy air jibe and light air jibe. But, um, yeah, we'll just talk about wire driving because that's, hopefully that's all we do here <laughs> versus sit-run jibing. But, uh, yeah, I mean, basically you just go and you get the boat set up. We pre-cleat the weather jib sheet. We get the pull launcher line free, and actually we throw it overboard so that it's going to run run well. And then, yeah, you just you count down, and, uh, yeah, I get the tiller extender you know, down on the new side, and, uh, you know, I count three, two, one, and usually I'm starting to turn at about three, and then my goal is to get the boom over and my head on the other side of the boom before the pole comes off, because the pole's on a bungee cord, and there's two of them, one on each side, and it comes shooting back super fast, and we've, you know, most skippers have have broken noses and, and you know, gashed heads from, from that pole, so yeah, you just... That does two things. One, it gets your head in a safe spot, and it gets the boom on the new side, which the windier it gets, the more important it is. Once that boom's on the new side and full, the, you can steer and you can control the boat pretty well. So, yeah, my goal is to get to get my head on the other side before the boom, before the spinnaker pole comes off, and to get the boom over and the boat driving. Yeah, and if it's really, really windy, my goal is to just, you know, use all this ballast in the right place. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If it's we call it a gorge jibe, and you just go into the jibe and you get the boom over, and you don't worry about the spinnaker. Like you'll sort that out later. And it's just the crew does weight, and then once the weight's under control, yeah, you reach down and grab the spinnaker sheet. So you're gonna snap in and snap out. You gotta hook into the newest side, Adam. Talk about jibing from the crew position. Uh, well, I mean. Literally the last time we practiced, I did this on attack and missed my hook and fell in the water. So I don't always do it perfectly um, by any stretch of the imagination. But no, you know, getting it out on the wire quickly is important. Um, I mean, ultimately ends up being much more about like your sequencing of the different things you have to do. So for me, I have to swing in, get off the wire, eject the pole. Uh, pull the vang over, uncleat the old spin sheet, get the new pole out, get the spin sheet from Mike, and then get on the wire. So there's, you know, and all of that happens in a, you know, a few seconds. So it's, um, you know, there's there's a bit to do there. And I find the thing is like, it's sort of like his steering. If he steers the first part of the jibe well, everything else will go right. If I can kind of get the pole off on the old side, you know, well. Like everything is smoother after that. So I, I find it's more just like getting it right to start with as opposed to like trying to be all hurried about it. Yeah. And one thing that we found is that smoother is faster. Like everyone tries to get everything done super fast. But if you just try to do it smooth, it's going to be faster. Other question. Yes. I was just wondering about the uh, the timing for that pull release and the, the boom switch are you coordinating that together or is it sort of like if if mike's late on getting the uh, boom across there's just higher chance of getting hit with the pole are you looking yeah that's his that? that's his that's his department uh, <laughs> no i think i think at this point honestly i can sort of feel where the what he's doing even though i can't see him right because i can kind of sort of see the front of the boom of course right um and there are some times when i can tell like he's a little late and i'll wait you know to eject the pole just because i don't want him to get hit in the head um, but most of the time, yeah, I can kind of like, he's already got his part done before I'm in the boat and ejecting, but yeah, you can kind of feel it, but that's a, it's a little bit different than some other skippers do. Uh, I mean, I've sailed with Howie before and he's totally different. It's like you eject the pole, it comes back and then you do the job. So there's more than one way to do it. Yes. <laughs> as I said, I've had that problem before. Yeah, and I mean, my goal with getting, you know, I kept saying getting the boom across as soon as possible. The whole time, like as soon as you're not in your VMG downwind position, the boat's decelerating. So like the sooner you can get that boom across, 
and get out on the water and, and sailing fast, you know, that's good. And so, yeah, if you just, that whole time you're slowing down, it, one, you're losing VMG, and two, it, the slower you go, the harder it is to jive because you have more apparent. So you just go right into it, you know. Well, Mike Martin and Adam Lowry, thanks for sharing your insights on the five O's. Good luck in the worlds with eight championships between you. We think you got a pretty good shot, but that's sailboat racing. Thanks, thanks for being Ryan. on the Wednesday right, Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, boys. Glad you made has been a presentation of the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon.